going on, internet world? My name is Dylan Pierpont, and I figured um, just because I posted a few painting time-lapse videos in the past, I thought it might be helpful for a few of you out there to hear me explain some of my process by actually narrating one of these time-lapse sessions, so we're going to see how this goes. Um, I suppose this tor tutorial is geared more towards beginners and anyone that's kind of just curious about my general workflow. Um, so what you're going to see here is the process I used from initial concept to final illustration for an album commission. Uh, the overall composition and color palette is fairly simplistic so it should make the, uh, the procedures and the methods pretty easy to follow. Before we get started, just a few notes on my hardware setup. Uh, I'll be working primarily in Photoshop CS5 on an Alienware M15X with an Intel i7 processor and 6 gigs of memory running Windows 7 64-bit. None of that really matters, or it should, shouldn't matter, um, but I know some people are interested in digital artist specs, so there you go. Uh, connected to the laptop, I'm hooked up to an HP ZR24W IPS monitor and a Wacom Intuos 3 6x8 graphics tablet. The work you're about to see was one of two cover commissions uh, by Ducky for her newly released EP called The Weather. So before you go any further, pause this video and head on over to www.duckymusic.com and check out all her work. She's got links to all her most recent cuts and music videos from around the world, so definitely worth checking out. Uh, in the meantime, sit back and, and let me know what you think. Uh, I'll try and release more in-depth tutorials in the future, so if there's anything you'd like to see or, or feel can be improved, then speak up. Uh, so thanks, thanks so much, and enjoy. One of the first things I did when working with Ducky was try to establish some sort of direction and we were actually able to hit that pretty quickly when she mentioned that she felt these two pieces needed to be much darker than her previous works and that that really meshed pretty well for me and my interests because that tends to be the emotional undertone that I'm naturally drawn to you know creepy things paranormal elements psychological horror just kind of you know weird shit and from that I was able to start brainstorming ideas uh, through thumbnail sketches to see where we might consider taking these two these two projects. Um, I spent some time going through uh, her work on her website and found a music video she had shot in Paris last year called Wind Up Bird. And the whole thing, it was, it was really cool. They shot it in black and white. It had a really nice aesthetic to the whole production. But there was one scene in particular, I felt, that really resonated with what I had in mind. Um, if you watch the video, near the end, Ducky's actually dressed in these like these shawls and or this this robe gown thing and she's got all this jewelry on and she's wearing some sort of like weird feathered headpiece and I thought that the character she portrayed fell in line you know pretty perfectly with the theme we wanted to present so after roughing out a few sketches I sent them over to her for approval and she really loved the idea of developing this character into the focal point for her new EP one thing I should mention, and I, I honestly I can't stress this enough, was just how open and supportive she was of my vision for these projects. She essentially said in one of our, our first emails, look, I want these to feel a bit dark, a little bit creepy, but the rest is up to you. And as an artist, that was really freeing to hear. Um, I mean, most of the time when you're working freelance or in-house for a studio, your client's IP might have a very strict or pre-established look for the entire project, and there's very little room to do some real blue sky style collaborating. But with Ducky, she really gave me complete creative freedom, and I, you know, I can't thank her enough for that. So once the concept was approved, and I, you know, I, I blew up the selected thumbnail, and on a new layer, you know, I filled it with white and dropped the opacity down a bit, so I could see you know barely the uh, the thumbnail showing through underneath and you know from there I'm able to call up a new layer and start refining the thumbnail into a more developed sketch or line drawing and this is pretty typical of my process for most illustration work sometimes I'll have a really clear idea of how the composition is going to play out for the final and so the line drawing will translate pretty faithfully from the initial thumbnail 
Other times, you know, what, what works in, in a loose thumbnail drawing might completely fall apart when you start to detail, you know, out the final lines. And you might need to revisit or shift around some of the elements to make that composition work. Other times, you know, whatever you did in a thumbnail might not translate at all, and you'll have to start from scratch. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I play around with these thumbnails so that you can get your best ideas out early and not waste time trying to, you know, define something that, that just isn't working. Um, with this one, I was pretty happy with the flow of the composition in the thumbnail stage, so we stuck pretty close to that initial idea for the final. The character's position, you know, on the right side of the frame and, and the loop that the neck of that duck headdress makes really creates a soft curve from the bottom up through the top and kind of circles around into the focal point. And that more or less resembles, you know, the golden mean at the same time trying to preserve uh, the idea that, you know, we keep these compositions in the rule of thirds. And at those lines of intersection, that's where, you know, there's going to be information that the viewer is going to want to look at. That's generally where a focal point is going to lie. You'll also notice as we go through this on the left hand side of the screen is a collection of reference photos that I use to help me during certain sections of the piece. Um, over time, I've built up a library of reference photos, everything from people to locations to objects to other art and artists and paintings, sculpture, you know, even music. So anything that might help to inspire and kind of aid in, in the, uh, the uh, creation process. So here what you're seeing is a few different shots of different hairstyles, different makeup treatments, and a few head angles that are close to what I intended with the initial thumbnail. Um, it's important to remember though, you know, how you should be using reference if and when you think you need it. You know, for instance, I, I laid out all the groundwork um, for how, more or less, you know, I wanted this character to be posed. I knew I wanted her body to be in, in a profile or, or slightly three-quarter shot, um, but I knew her head was going to be kind of looking up and off into the distance, so it was going to be an upshot at three-quarter. So I scanned through my collection of photos to find a head angle that falls in line with that idea. Um, you'll notice the line drawing doesn't match any one of the photos exactly. They're just meant to be used as tools and guides to help figure out you know, how extreme or not certain areas of the face are perceived of um, or perceived at from, from certain angles. The rest relies on anatomy knowledge and proportions of the face, and that's where your Loomis and your Bridgman and your Hogarth studies will really come into play. Uh, just a side note, in case anyone out there doesn't already know, um, all the Loomis, you know, figure, face, illustration, I think he's got a, I think there's a painting book up there too. Um, anyway, they're all available online for free, and I'll drop the, uh, the link um, below. It's been a while since I've been there. Um, but I actually I checked this afternoon and the PDF was still active on that site. So hopefully by the time you see this, you know, go take a look, see if it's something you're interested in. Um, but the idea is if you understand the basic canon of the human head, uh, both male and female, you can adhere that knowledge along with certain attributes to any character you plan on developing in your illustration work or your concept and production art you know whatever you want to start creating characters for and really getting emotion out of them you're going to be able to do that through the face if you understand the basics in terms of the costume i wanted to have a bit of fun with the shapes and the time period and i had this sort of personal story running through my head that this character might have been some sort of outcast girl that has a tendency to dabble in dark magic or bizarre behavior and at one point during the thumbnail stage um, I actually had a scene where there was some sort of sacrificial table that had ruins and, and sh you know drapery and it was all in candlelight and um, bowls and chalices and plucked feathers and just crap like that um, but since I felt it started to really date the piece um, and it made it feel a little bit too much like it came from the past I decided to nix it so Although we don't see any of that um, table scene in this final piece, I tried to counter um, that idea by mixing and matching old world and new world fashions, which is why she's wearing, you know, this some sort of gothic Elizabethan Victorian some you know corset with 
ties on her chest and a precious stone collar. Um, but coupled with that, she also has these military shoulder sleeves and hoop earrings and eyeshadow and mascara and all that stuff. So at some point, um, you know, I even tossed in some, I think I had some feathers that were kind of Woodstock hippie-ish, I don't know, something like that, free-spirited type shit. Um, and they were tied in her hair. And I actually ended up, I think I took those out near the end uh, that you'll see. But I played around with the idea of giving her tiny vampire fangs for a second. I don't know, I've been watching True Blood lately and I love Blade and all that stuff. Um, but I felt that would only reinforce the old world vibe and it would start to detract from the idea that while she is a collection of identities, throwing, you know, quote unquote vampire into the mix would only solidify one persona. And I'd rather the viewer question her motives rather than label her as a well-known, iconic sort of figure. So to help reinforce the drama and contradiction of the character, um, I wanted to give her that otherworldly sense. And I didn't want any iris or pupils in, in her eyes. And that, you know, that way uh, the viewer can't exactly connect with her on a certain level. You know, there's that that human-to-human that -human contact. But to bring back uh, her sense of humanity, I decided to paint in some tears and maybe have that, that, eye, you know, that mascara or eyeshadow running down her face so that we know somewhere you know, deep down she does, in fact, have thoughts and emotions. Uh, what, what those feelings are, I guess, is whatever. That's anyone's guess, but I don't know. I thought, I thought it was a nice way to kind of bring back some, some human characteristic into this otherwise kind of creepy... Uh, person. So I've jumped into a program called Daz Studio and this is a free software package you can find online and I'm using it here strictly as lighting reference. Um, when you're working on a tight deadline, especially if it's in a studio environment, there might not be time to set up your lighting you know, just right or exactly how you envision it and shoot your own reference, you know, let alone uh, hire a model to come in and pose for you. So what this program does is give you relatively simple control over where and how light reacts to a basic figure. And you can pose and set up the figure in whatever position you'd like, you know, before dropping in a few different light sources um, and adjusting the temperature and intensity. You can keep it as white light. You, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of different options that you can kind of go through to see what's going to work best for, for your project. Uh, depending on the mood you're going for, you can use one light and really push that, that form shadow um, or fill the figure and the scene with as many lights as you'd like to maybe expand the value range. Uh, what I've done here is go with more or less a rim light on the far side of the face to really set her apart from what will eventually become the darker background. And on top of that, I'll add a soft top-down light to kind of increase the cast shadows from her brow line and really pop the whites of those eyes uh, that I have in mind. And finally, I'll add kind of a, a soft fill light that kind of goes over the whole scene to smooth out the transition from light to dark and, and maybe dampen the contrast just a bit. Um, because I can always go back and choose to pump up my accents later on in Photoshop. That's, that's not really an issue. This will also help me determine how the other costume elements that she's wearing uh, will be affected by the lighting setup. So I can use this render as a guide to determine how those forms will look in comparison to the figure and, and how those forms are going to push and pull one another. As far as painting goes, I like to start in grayscale before glazing over, um, over the top with, with color. And that's a technique that you can use in, in oil painting and, and acrylics as well. You kind of start your entire underpainting in a grayscale value and then you can slowly build up um, color and richness and, and you know saturation and stuff like that with thin you know coats of, of color glaze so there's not very much pigment um, but as far as digital painting goes recently I've been trying to do a lot more direct painting and going in with straight color and, and kind of bypassing the the value stage in terms of black and white altogether uh, it can be a little trickier because then you're, you're trying to think of, you know, value and color and intensity kind of all at the same time. Um, but for this piece, I didn't really do that because I didn't have a set color palette in mind. So I just I stuck with the black and white values. Um, I'll begin by like filling out the shape with a mid-tone gray 
and this kind of does two things for me. Uh, that shape, as long as I keep it pretty crisp, um, I can use that as a clipping mask and separate the figure or the character or whatever it is that I've masked out. I can separate that from the background. So if I need to paint really cleanly behind that, that mask, um, I can do so without being too concerned that I'm going to destroy you know, painting over the top of anything because it's going to slip right behind that figure. Um, and the second part is it kind of using the midtone gray that kind of acts as a midway point for my value range. So I can choose to go lighter or darker and start turning the forms really quickly um, as opposed to if, if I was painting directly into a white background it might be a little more difficult for me to, to fill out those values as fast. Because I chose to keep most of my DAS model in shadow, I'll try and render most of the character in that, that mid-tone to darker or low end of the value scale, and I'll really save my highlights for later on. Um, but before I get too invested with the forms, you know, I'll quickly brush in the, the local value for some of the materials. So objects like her corset and her hair and her shoulder piece, the way I have them pictured in my head, they're going to be very dark in comparison to her flesh tones. For now, I'm just using a soft, round, default Photoshop brush to lay down the values and create some soft blends to help turn the form. And this particular brush is especially helpful when working with female anatomy so to you know, suggest soft skin. Um, you'll have to break up the surface eventually later on, simply because you know, humans don't have porcelain smooth skin. So unless you're trying to go for that effect, um, it's going to feel a little unnatural to paint in that manner. But I like to begin with subtle shades and work my way up to coarser brushes. Um, I'll make sure to keep my line art separate so that I can flick that layer on and off and see how strong my shapes are reading without, you know, with and without the, the lines as a guide. Um, and sometimes I might leave on the line work in certain areas for the finish or very near to the finish in tight spaces to utilize something that could be faked for occlusion shadows or somewhere where I might need like a harder edge. But for the most part, the goal is to, to paint out all the line art by the time we're finished. One of the most important things you can learn as a student is how to give your image weight and solidity by accurately representing its form through light and shadow. So just for a quick lesson here, you can see five areas of interest when it comes to value. And these are represented in order from the light side of the object to the dark side um, as highlight transition or local value, core shadow, reflected light, and cast shadow. And if you can understand how these five elements work, you can start pushing the realism into your own images and really start to build up the complexity with your scenes. Um, as objects begin to react to the presence of others through cast shadows and reflected light and that sort of stuff, the scene will feel much more tangible as a three-dimensional you know, image on a two-dimensional plane. So I'm just adjusting some of the lighting patterns as they kind of correlate to the DAS model that, that I set up. And as I started screwing around with the length of, of the sleeve um, here, I kind of reminded myself that its, its design was based on military type fashion. And I thought of those military honor cords that you see kind of in fully dressed guard and stuff like that. Um, I saw a lot of those actually during, uh, I was watching, um, it was the royal wedding and almost everybody there was decked out in their, you know, all their crazy military honor whatever gear. And I saw a ton of those cords that are, you know, they're kind of hanging off the shoulder like that. So I looked up some reference shots to see what kind of style might help break up that arm uh, with some materials that still mimic the shapes I've kind of established already for the shoulder. So if you notice the arch of that, that shoulder piece, um, it's mirrored slightly in, in the drapery of the cords. And I also tried something out to kind of imply the detail of the weave of those cords without having to sketch in every little tiny bit. So I kind of picked up a, a chain link brush that I downloaded a while ago. You can find that thing almost anywhere. Um, and I messed around with the orientation a bit and the spacing and, and the stroke direction. And I picked out a darker value to kind of quickly brush in some loops to indicate the cords weave or, or the twist in the fabric. You'll also notice a few times I've selected and duplicated certain spots of the painting um, and adjusted the value through a multiply layer or a screen layer, or, you know, sometimes with overlay and, and uh, soft light. Um, but in the case of the chords, I started painting on a new layer altogether. And once I'm happy with the changes I've made, you know, I'll really make an effort to crush everything back down into a single layer. 
and this helps keep the file size down you know sometimes especially depending on the resolution of the images that you're working on and the hardware on your system Photoshop's a big memory hog so when you're doing stuff that's really high res it can start to bog down uh, performance but this helps keep like I said the file size down and it it really gives me a safety blanket in case you know I want to do something drastic like add a new element to the painting but I'm not really sure how it's gonna how it's gonna look with a final composition so once you're happy you know merging into a single layer it'll keep your canvas nice and clean and neat and really I mean unless you're a matte painter or compositing artist or you know whatever and you need to make changes on the fly for promotional art or, or a piece that's kind of constantly evolving I think it's usually safe to to keep your files to just a few layers um, you'll see that I might have more than that in this video from time to time um, but more often than not they're not visible you know they're not actually showing up in the final piece and that's because they were sketch elements that I wanted to try but they really ended up getting deleted later on so it's just I mean it's a matter of finding out what's comfortable for you and your process I wasn't entirely sure how a duck's wing is constructed uh, so I quickly found some shots online just a couple ducks here and there that showed you know their wings from a few different angles and I just pieced the rest together in my head to to match the original sketch my brush set is completely unorganized uh, I used to think you know back in high school that that the brushes really made the artist in the digital world so I stocked up on whatever brushes I could find and I think after going to art school and, and painting and sketching every day I realized that it's really just how the artist uses his or her tools to, to create a really compelling image you know there's there's no special secret with all those crazy brushes that are out there um, there are some helpful ones you know that can that can speed up your process you know I think I already mentioned the chain link brush and you know near the end here you'll see I use a, a smoke brush to add a little bit of atmosphere um, but for the most part as long as you know how they work I mean you can do an entire piece using just the Photoshop defaults and I've listened to interviews with guys like Marco Djurjevic and, and Dave Raposa and I mean, I've heard those guys use a single round brush from start to finish for, for their entire work. So really just experiment with what works for you, and, and over time your process will evolve into, into something that's going to be a lot more efficient. I felt like because the character was pushed to the far right of the frame, there was, there was really a lot of negative space um, to the left side of the composition that wasn't, that wasn't being used. And because I knew we weren't going to be messing, you know, a whole lot with the background too much, um, I was trying to think of something else we could do that wouldn't destroy the composition, but also make sense within the scene. And possibly we could use it as a way to to frame out the space for for the title. Um, around that same time, though, I, I got an email from Ducky, and she told me that the deadline was kind of pushed up. I had initially I had till the end of the month for this one, um, but she was telling me that we would need it. A little bit faster than that so instead of spending too much time thinking about the lighting and, and sketching you know this adjustment from memory um, instead I, I just jumped right back into Daz and using the same same pose same model as before I just raised her arm and adjusted her fingers to suggest some sort of arbitrary hand movement if you really watch a lot of people and you know I do this all the time I, I really think we all do but people absentmindedly do all sorts of random gestural motions with their hands. I mean, you see this all the time when girls twirl their hair in between their fingers or guys crack their knuckles out of habit. I mean, we all have these these little quirks that usually go unnoticed, but sometimes, you know, little things like that can really be the best way to bring some life back into a character that, you know, might otherwise feel kind of stagnant. I sometimes think babies are the craziest people on the planet to watch because they've really just started becoming aware of themselves, you know? So like sometimes you'll see that kid that's riding around in a shopping cart with their parent and you have this, this, all this commotion with other shoppers rushing around the aisles and there's big huge ads everywhere you look and every single surface of, you know, on the entire store. And this kid is just sitting there like mesmerized by their own two hands. Like, they just now realized at the end of their arm, you know, is this chubby little ball with five little stumps sticking out that can move around if they concentrate really hard. You know, it's just, I think that's just so awesome to watch sometimes. This is a neat trick that's pretty quick to make, but useful for adding some motion to your piece. Um, it's just a bunch of fiery embers that 
you can basically make by dotting in you know a few different size spots with a hard round brush and then duplicating that layer and playing around with the motion blur settings um, once you're satisfied with how you know those two layers look together you can merge those down and then duplicate and flip and readjust the size or positioning um, to make new sets and make them feel like they're they're floating around in, in all different directions uh, you can also use the edit transform warp tool to add some bend into their movement um, because the motion blur effect only works in a straight line but if you notice in real life you know embers aren't like streaks of rain they kind of float wherever the heat and the air travel takes them so it's good to vary up their movement um, I also made sure to use them as a way to lead your eye up into the negative space between the hand and the string of feathers tied to the duck's beak because that's where I've kind of reserved a space for the album title. So this is where I start glazing color into the grayscale and you know because it's Photoshop <laughs> there's a few different ways to go about it. Um, I started by flipping through some reference photos to to see what could work with the theme we decided to go with and I thought because we had such a dark and eerie setting it might actually help to bring some warmth into the scene so initially I figured what might work um, to do the entire piece in a warm palette uh, by literally setting you know the composition on fire so I found a painting by Keikai Kataki that was done for Guild Wars and it had a lot of the a lot of the elements that I was looking for a lot of heated colors a lot of energy with the reds and the oranges and the yellows um, along with a photo that I found um, on AOL's newsfeed that had a fireman with this huge wall of fire behind him. The only problem I saw with going straight up fire blaze was that I didn't think there would be enough visual interest to really hold you know the piece together because we you know we really only have one figure and we don't have a background um, it's really just kind of a, a haze back there with with the subtle atmosphere and I wanted a bit more diversity in my color palette so I mixed up a small color swatch that used warm analogous colors like reds and oranges and yellows but then tossed in a color string of green to work as a complement to the red um, because red is such a dominant color and it can have overpowering intensity um, by adding a bit of green as a complement that really helped to balance out its behavior. Once I've more or less decided on the color scheme I want to use I'll throw on either a color layer or an overlay layer to kinda get the ball rolling and the color layer will let you add color into your piece without affecting the values underneath. So if you want to test this out, you can add a color layer over your black and white painting and uh, fill it with a really saturated color, we'll just say blue, um, and then add a new color layer on top of that and fill it with solid black. And what that does is it gives you a nice black and white filter that you can flick on and off. So leave that black and white on and uh, flick the blue um, layer on and off and you shouldn't notice any change your values are going to stay exactly the same but if you change that blue layer to say an overlay and flick that on and off you'll notice that your values have shifted and that's because overlay adds not only saturation but pushes your darks darker and your lights lighter and how intense this change is really depends on the value of the color that you're using um, because of this you do have to be careful when laying down the initial glaze because you know I've, I've done this before um, if you don't pay attention you know the saturation can get out of hand kinda quick if you're not careful so to keep that you know saturation issue in check um, I use this method that a good friend of mine taught me and if you go to window and then go over to color or I think you can just press F6 on your keyboard um, it's gonna open up your color sliders and then in the top right of that window there should be a drop down menu where you can select HSB and this is a great tool for adjusting the hue saturation and, and brightness or values I've been saying here um, of any given color on the fly and you'll notice that there are percentage markers next to each slider and when you're glazing over black and white the color is picked up fairly well between 15 and 85 percent on the value scale anything outside of that range tends to be either too bright or too dark to really hold that, that digital pigment. So pick your lightest light on your piece um, and your darkest dark and you know see if they're within that range. If not, you might want to make some adjustments with your levels or curves to flatten out the contrast a bit. 
Otherwise, you might, you know, when you start adding color, you might be too dark and your accents will appear solid black. Or you might be too bright and you're going to get blowout and your lights are going to feel way too overexposed. Um, now, this obviously depends on the type of effect you're trying to achieve with your lighting setup. Um, and, of course, the materials that you're trying to render. So maybe that works for your particular project, but for this one, I wanted to focus my color around the character and let everything else kind of bleed off into darkness. So when we're done with this, you'll see, because I don't really have any high reflective materials, you know, with high specularity, um, even my lightest light doesn't hit a true 100% white, and I'm still able to get some really nice color into my highlights. I tend to get kind of finicky with the color balance near the end of a piece as I try to really solidify the temperature variations of the highlights and the shadows. So some of the last minute touches I do are final value adjustments and I make sure to swap out the warm haze at the bottom um, of the composition with a, with a cooler green and that really helps to lift the character off the page a little bit better. You know you have that, that warm foreground and cool background. Um, I also paint out the hippie feathers and shrink the ones that are in the duck's mouth to make room for where the title will eventually be placed. And I also make sure to flatten out the entire image into a new layer on top of everything. Um, and I'll goss and blur it, but I think it's usually around 10 to 20 percent. It really, I mean, it kind of depends on, on how blurry you're trying to get here. Um, and I'll throw on a layer mask and I will brush in the edges that I want to remain, you know, hard and crisp near the focal point or the center of interest. And that way we kind of get a, we're, we're faking a slight depth of field effect. And that's pretty much it. I uh, hope you enjoyed watching the video and I hope you picked up a few tips along the way. Definitely do not forget to check out this EP along with the rest of Ducky's tracks at duckymusic.com. Um, and if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to shoot me an email at dylan.pierpont at gmail.com. Or you can hop over to my website at dylanbeerbot.com. Shameless self-promotion. Uh, and I have buttons on there to all my social media things like Face Space and Twitter Tube. All that fun crap. So take care, keep drawing, and I will see you guys next time.